part of my job is trying to integrate some of the NASA assets, the satellites, the UAVs, and the ground sensors into the sensor web. And we are very interested in trying to make that data available to the scientists, but we're also very interested in generating information to our end users. We have a societal mandate, mandate to uh, provide that kind of information that may be relevant during a disaster. For example, we might be interested in generating a flood map or a landslide forecast. So that's the kind of API we are very interested in putting together to help not only the scientists but our end users. So we want to make our API stick. So what does that mean? What that means is we may be able to generate an API that takes our data and I make it available to the first person. But then we want the information to go from one person to another to the end user that may be in Namibia. Okay? And we want that person in Namibia to be able to regenerate that same activity and activate the same process and execute our API or the various APIs that have been used to generate that product. And you may be interested in doing the same thing. That's how you can get that API, the API that you are designing to stick and increase the value for your end users. Now, I'm you're probably going to wonder, why am I calling that REST API level 5? OK, you've probably never heard of that. And that's a quest that we are trying to achieve and go up the summit to reach level five. So you've probably heard of level zero, one, two, and three, and that's the maturity model that has been uh, defined by Leonard Richardson to try to organize what REST should be. So you're probably on that same journey trying to migrate your API from level 0 to level 1 to level 2 and eventually achieve level 3. Okay? And that's part of what Mike was talking about this morning about hypermedia is trying to get to that level 3. And that's very important. That's very important for us at NASA to get to level 3. However, this is not the end as far as we can tell. Getting to level 3, that's only halfway there. I mean, what we're seeing is there's more after level three. And that's something we're starting to realize and say, hey, we need to get up there. That's where the action is. So why is this important to us? Well, we're part of an international community. We have to work with ESA. We have to work with the Canadians. We have to work with the Italians. We have to work with a lot of people. We're part of the group on Earth observations, and the end goal for that architecture is to provide information to the end users, not just data. Okay, so it doesn't stop about a simple API to push some data to one user. We want to push that information to the end users to make it actionable. Okay? What we have to work with is not only one API, but it's a bunch of APIs. We have tried to define those APIs at the Open Geospatial Consortium to interface with a map server. So we have a web map service, we have a web processing service, we have a sensor planning service, we have a sensor observation service, we have a workflow chaining service, we have a web feature service, we have all kind of APIs. And the problem is, those APIs are great, but for our users, that's too complicated. It's too many of them. They just cannot handle it. Okay? So you have to remember is, yeah, you're designing a great API, 
but your users might be using 10 different other APIs, and you have to try to make their lives easier. One thing we forget when we design an API is where is the user in this? Okay, we are all concerned about our data, all concerned about how to interface a machine to the data, but the user may not care about your data or your resources. A user cares about information. And there may be a disconnect between the data you have and the information that the user wants to have. In my case, we can generate hyperspectral data, multispectral data, radar data, and that means nothing to my users. They want a flood map. They want a visual picture. Okay? And we want that information to be pushed across. So we have to remember this, that disconnect between information and data. The key here is information. So at the level five, what we're talking about here is, is about using storytelling. How can we move information from one person to another? Well, we have solved that problem. We know how to do this, and that's using storytelling. That's the way we have been doing it for a thousand years. I mean, if you think about it, that's what we're doing today with Facebook and Twitter. We're still moving stories through the social network. So we know how to do this. We just have to do it within our API, and not after the fact, but in a proactive manner. And that's what we're talking about here, the level five API. So we need to define user activities that users can perform, but it's very important is to define behaviors, which are sequences of activities that the user can then get in real time and execute on the fly. Okay? That's what the user cares about, is activities to meet goals and the behavior to follow, to perform those activities and meet those goals. That's level five. So here's my story. These are real stories. That's a flood in, in um, Haiti, Port-au-Prince. And we have a user out there very interested in getting a flood map for that area. And she takes her phone and says, hey, give me a flood map in that area. So what we do, what we want to do, we're not doing that yet, but what we want to do is simply send a query out to the available services that could probably meet that goal. I say probably. So we have a MODIS service, a radar sat service, and an EO1 service. These are satellites out there. We can retrieve the behaviors from the services and execute those in real time on the client side. And as a result, what we get is the final product. That user doesn't know what happened, what it takes to turn that data into the product. She was just focused on a goal she wanted to meet, and then we just enabled that by supplying behaviors to follow to meet that goal. That's API level five. Once the activities are performed, then it becomes very simple. We can generate an activity stream. It gets on uh, Facebook. Then other users can see that on the timeline and say, hey, that's kind of cool. That's information I'm interested in. So now what I can do is I can click on the links and I can perform that same activity. I can use that same API. And all of a sudden that API starts sticking it starts being used more and more and more. And that information keeps flowing from one user to another. And we know how to do this. I mean, if, if you're doing agile programming, you're already using user stories. You know what that is. You know what an activity is. What you have to do is define a verb, an object, and a target. There's a protocol to do this. It's called activity streams. And as a developer, you know how to put those stories together. 
And that's what I call level four. If you use Facebook, then you probably know how to define those activities, how to define the verbs, how to define the objects. So we're going to make them stick. We're going to make them, um, they're going to be able to propagate via the social network. So in my case, what I had to do is just define a way to acquire the data, download the data and maybe search it, and define what the flood map is. And all of a sudden, the flood map is discoverable, and the user can start getting that kind of information. Once I have those activities defined, what I can do is, is then define the behavior that's going to sequence the activities. And you probably know how to do this too. That's behavior-driven development, same thing. But in our case, what we want to do is, we want a behavior that we can execute in real time on demand. So how can we encode the behavior? Well, that's the problem that has already been kind of solved in the, in the game industry. And what they've done is they've been using behavior trees. And that's kind of a mix, something in between the scripting and workflows and maybe finite, sti finite state machine and maybe Yarkle planner. But it's a little bit easier. Okay, so that's something that we're looking at because it does work. People use it. There's already tools out there. And I think we have a way to, to push that information from one user to another. So if you're interested, there, there are a few links out there that you may want to follow. So let's talk about behavior tree. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's very simple. That's a way of sequencing activities in different ways. So you can say, at the top, you have a goal, and you want to execute the first two activities in parallel. And maybe on the second level, you may want to execute those two in sequence. So you'll be interested in executing both of them. And you may have a conditional that says, well, maybe you can do this, or you may, maybe you can't. And then it comes back and it goes to the next one. So you execute one or more of those. Now the selector is you execute one only. So the first one that succeeds returns. And that's it. That's all there is to it. So you can get this very quickly. A developer can get this. And what you have to do is then define the actions that have to take place, and that's the activity. And the activity can happen on the server side. So what happens in real time, my user is here and says, hey, I want to get a flood map. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that I need to have a flood map out there set as goals that are being published on the web. OK? And my various services have to be able to respond and say, OK, you need a flood map. Here's a behavior that you need to follow to get a flood map. And maybe there's five tasks, five tasks to do this to get a flood map. But it doesn't matter. To the user, it's kind of transparent. OK? So it comes back, and then on the client side, it's just a matter of assembling more and more trees in real time. OK? Then on the client side, you have a very simple structure that you can walk through. And then eventually, you get to an activity. And then there's a simple HTTP post to execute that activity on the server side. And then the client doesn't care how it happens. It just happens. But then you get a product back. So this is code on demand. Activity is defined. The call is made. The product is returned. And the client eventually gets a product. So here's a recap. Service that you want to develop, you as a developer. 
what you do is, usually you start with zero stories, right? Then what you do next is you do your test scenarios, right? And then eventually you develop your service. That's a normal methodology, right? And then you start having a user play with, with your service, right? Well, maybe not. What you may want to do is you start with the user stories, and then you map to user activities, and then you have the behaviors, and then you add your service. And your user, instead of interfacing to the service directly, may simply have to, to get the behaviors. If you want to know more about behavior trees, I mean, look at what Game AI has been doing. I mean, there's some very good stuff out there, and, and that's an example to follow. So let me take you some, through some uh, other examples about uh, behavior trees. In my case, for Modis, I want to get a flood map. So the flood map is at the top. That's my goal. If you remember some of Mike's presentations yesterday, I mean, that's like a Don Norman kind of picture of where you start with a goal at the top, and then you've got the activities you want to perform. So in my case, for Modis, I want to get the tile for that area of interest. Maybe I have it, maybe I don't. But if I do, then I want to return it to you. For E01, for a satellite E01, that's a hyperspectral imager, I don't have tiles, but I may be able to task the satellite in real time. The user doesn't need to know, but the user may want to be able to get some feasibility and say, hey, you can get it three days from now. Well, that's kind of nice. And then I simply have to process that data with a specific algorithm, and then I get the product, then I get it back. And I get data at 30 meters. But with RadarSat 2, it looks like it's the same behavior, but actually tasking the satellite is very different. User doesn't need to know this, okay? So the parameters may be very different, but they're going to be tailored for getting a flood map. That's the goal. And then eventually you get the data. So on the user side, what the user has to do is to get those particular trees, assemble them, and maybe in that case we want to run them in parallel or in sequence. It might be what the first product I can get because I'm in a hurry. I want to get all of it, and then I just have to execute it, and then meet my goal. That's level five API. So how can I define behavior trees? Well, here are some examples, because we want to see code. How does this work? Well, that's an example of using maybe a Ruby DSL. And then here's how it would look like from a GUI perspective as a tree. And here's how it looks like in JSON. That already exists. We can use that today. The beauty of this is it, it's in JSON, and you can push that to the client and execute that in real time. All you have to do is to define a task identifier and then a function out there, and then you've got your task to execute and perform an HTTP on the service side. The big advantage that we see had of that kind of approach is that it, then it doesn't matter how it's, it is implemented at the lower layers. It can be using SOAP, it can be using RPC, or it can be using REST level three. The user doesn't care, okay? And that's very important to us. That's an interoperability issue that, that matters if we want to support the users in Namibia, in Kenya, or Haiti to get access to true information very quickly. And if we want that information to go from one user to another. Here's some, so, some credits to Mike and, and Stu that, that we started in September last year. I mean, we had a problem to solve and, and that's your approach that, that we're taking today to try to, to solve that problem. 
the code already exists. I mean, what I had to do is to take some, uh, some code on GitHub and customize it a little bit to apply it to behavior trees. And there was some code already in, in JavaScript from Mary Rose Cook and took that, customized it a little bit. Facebook already exists. You can use it today. They have open graphs. That's pretty cool. I mean, you should look into this. And then you, you can put it together. This is not a big, big deal. This is API level five. This is where we're trying to go. So I'm, I'm really interested in, in more people trying to help, trying to get up to the summit and conquer that guy, because we need to get there. That's important to our users. I need you guys to help me get there. That is important. Thank you. <laughs>